morning, folks. Can you hear me all right? <coughs> cool. Uh, so Jamie asked me a couple of weeks ago if I'd be willing to jump in and put together a message for today. So this is, uh, this is what I was able to come up with in a fairly short period of time. <coughs> uh, I've got a birthday coming up here in less than two weeks. And uh, birthdays with zeros and birthdays where both numbers are the same uh, have always been or somehow seem more significant to me. Uh, maybe 11 didn't feel significant, but 55 feels weighty to me. If you view your life in chapters or acts or movements, I really don't know what chapter this is. <clears throat> it feels farther along than just plain old middle age. Is it two-thirds age? Is it three-quarters age? As an adopted person, I don't have biological relatives to look at for precedent. How long do they live? What should I expect? It's all uncharted waters. And so as I've entered this whatever time of my life it is, um, I've become more aware of a few things. First, my body. It's a thing I notice a lot. It's not quite as resilient as it once was. It doesn't bounce back quite as easily. The little aches here and there never completely go away. Uh, I'm in okay shape, but I've become increasingly aware of my limitations, of the things that I need to monitor, of the limits I should not push too hard, lest I suffer, suffer from residual regret, regret afterwards, afterwards. I wonder what I'll feel like in 20 years. I felt darn good 20 years ago, but just kind of okay today. My mind is restless. It's filled with songs and running narratives and voices telling me things. This mid-level din that's always on. It's telling me things that I should do or things that I shouldn't do or places that I should go or people that I need to talk to, um, projects I need to start or finish, uh, jobs I should try to get, songs I need to learn, activities I should try, relationships that need to be mended, reminded me relentlessly again and again and again in ways that I've never truly appreciated nor understood that the most precious commodity I have right now is time and that I need to use it wisely. Another thing that I've noticed more and more at my almost 55 age is that the size of my world starting to shrink just a little bit. It's an interesting phenomenon. I've seen it with older relatives and friends, this concept that the daily world that they interact with over time begins to get a little smaller. They close ranks, their circle of people and places and influence be influences becomes less fluid and more static and fixed, more immutable, more predictable. I always thought this was a little weird and maybe even a little sad that, and that this is something that could never possibly happen to me. We live big, we live boldly, we take risks, we do interesting things, we go to interesting places, we do things that we've never tried before. Life is a big apple and you need to take a big lusty bite out of it. But alas, I see the signs of slow retreat, of impending shrinkage. Most interesting to me is that not only do I see it, I kind of understand it. We make our world smaller because we want to surround ourselves with people and things that we like, things that make us feel happy and safe. And this all seems very reasonable, <clears throat> exchanging adventure and new experiences for comfort and familiarity and safety. I don't know if this is reasonable or not, and just because I'm starting to understand it doesn't mean that I embrace it. I think COVID has expedited some of this retreat. Its very nature requires us to make our world a little smaller, to be highly selective on where we open it up, 
And they say timing is everything. And COVID timing and the timing of my own life have aligned in a seemingly natural and expected, and yes, maybe even a little disappointing way. And this gets me to the thing I'm most, most aware of. The biggest thing I notice as I head into my future, and that is my fears. Now, fear is an interesting thing. It protects us. It makes us ask questions. It makes us wary of our surroundings. It generates worry, anxiety, and negative thoughts. I think about that esteemed and beloved philosopher, Yoda, <laughs> who says, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. A lot of this fear is about the state of our world. The aforementioned COVID springs to mind, the drought and the wildfires and the seemingly unfixable divisions in our society, the proliferation of misinformation, anti-science, anti-fact, anti-vax, anti-education, anti-anything that's not American, anti-kindness. I have fears about this country, the U.S., and the state that we'll leave it in for future generations that uh, and I'm wondering, is this all just a big failed experiment in laissez-faire economics? I have fears after seeing what happened on January 6th and that and our ongoing response to peaceful protests and this emerging faceless militia that we see out there now. Where's that going to go? I have fears about our attempts to suppress our real history the stories and events that tell us really where we've been and how we've gotten to where we are. So these are all really big, scary things. But we fear lots of smaller things, too. Fear of isolation, fear of being alone. Fears of the big disease, whatever it might be, because every one of us seems to land one at some point in our lives. Fear of losing independence, autonomy, fear of losing our ability to choose. Fear for my loved ones, that any of these things might befell them. And how do I ensure that they have the best opportunity for happiness and prosperity and peace and love and, and longevity? Now you might be sitting there thinking this is all pretty heavy stuff for just an almost 55-year-old guy. Or possibly you might be thinking, what a drama queen. He's got it so tough. But you wouldn't get an argument from me if you thought this, because I think both of these are valid interpretations. Um, and I don't spend a lot of my time worrying and fearing for all of these things. But at this stage in my development, they've entered the narrative into the cacophony of noise that's in my head. I worry about a lot of them more directly, like having an ongoing conversation, and others are just passive worries, like just a ever more loud background noise. I believe that all of us think about these things, and for some of us, they are occasional conversations, and for others, they may be more ongoing. We live our lives doing the best to balance, to mitigate, to defer and deflect, to manage through the things we worry about without letting them govern us. Each of us tries to understand what is the right amount of fear, healthy fear, that we should carry around with us. I read an article in The Atlantic, it's a columnist uh, by the name of Arthur Brooks, and it talks about our reaction when our lives are filled with threats and uncertainty. And it references a survey of the 95, I don't know why that number, but the 95 top fears of Americans. It's a study from 2018, so things, you know, probably have changed a little bit, but I don't think that much. And the top 15 are interesting to me. And I think they tell us a lot about who we are as a society. Number one, fear of a corrupt government. 
Number two, pollution of our oceans and rivers and lakes. Number three, pollution of our drinking water. Number four, not having enough money for our future. Number five, be people that I love becoming seriously ill. Number six, people that I love dying. Seven, air pollution. Eight, extinct extinction of plant and animal species. Nine, global warming and climate change. 10, high medical bills. 11, cyber terrorism. 12, US involvement in yet another war. 13, ex Islamic extremists. 14, white supremacists. 15, economic and financial collapse of our nation. I think it's a very in, that's a very interesting list of stuff, and it's a interesting mix of personal fears and societal fears. Um, the article goes on to talk about how we deal with our fears, and some of it is a little too kind of woo for me, but I'll paraphrase. It's kind of really four things. It's number one, talk about what you're afraid of. Don't be stoic, share what's in your head. Keeping it a secret will manifest itself in negative ways, such as hostility or aloofness. Being vulnerable is stimulating in itself, but it also allows others to provide you support and comfort. Number two, be overt. Tell someone your feelings for them especially to a friend or a family member for whom this would not feel natural. By telling them how you feel about them, it opens an intimacy, creating a more closeness and a more fortitude to possibly do it again. Number three, it's kind of similar to number two, take a risk. Confess to someone that you like them, that you admire them, that you want to get to know them. And this involves some personal risk of rejection or possibly a lack of reciprocity, push through that and do it anyway. And the last one, love your enemies. Now this one is hard, hard for me, mainly because I don't wanna love my enemies. It seems like so much work with so little possibility of really any benefit at all. I also recognize grudgingly that there's frequently something very admirable about people I know with whom I have profound disagreements. So each of us needs to decide how far we're willing to go here. Um, but finding common ground with someone who thinks differently than us can help mitigate our own fears and it helps to humanize others. So the gist of the article is that we should neutralize our fears with love. And not in a woo-woo, love you kind of way, but by carrying love in our heart, reflected in kindness, decency, empathy. And I confess that I'm not entirely sure how to do this. The article itself says it's really, really difficult. That leading with love is not a natural thing to do. Fear is much easier. So I'm starting to think that maybe time is an ally here. One of the benefits of getting older, I'm told, is that you start to care a lot less about stupid, unimportant things, and instead focus on those things that are the most valuable. And so I think this is part of the, probably part of the closing ranks thing I talked about a bit ago, um, having the discernment to pick the right battles to determine, determine what is truly worthy of occupying your brain space and consuming my most precious commodity of time. I haven't cracked the code on how to do this, though I am hopeful that I'm trending in a good direction. Maybe I'll get there when I'm 56.